experience, how do you go about raising that consciousness in an organization, yeah. raising that thinking, making persons become more aware that they're thinking in the parts rather than thinking in the system? That's, um, that's a skill I've developed over the last 30 plus years. And, and part of it is, is becoming more and more aware. I mean, I, I use, and you can see our, our cat has just shown up in that photo. <laughs> There's our, oops, down here is a little kitty cat. Um, in fact, <laughs> give, me, give me a minute, cat. Uh, Well, I've, um, as I've discovered, as I've discovered this, this approach, uh, as I've discovered, at least my interpretation of what Dr. Deming is saying and how it fits so well in with the issues I was dealing with, then I, as I studied his work, and then um, I, I, I took a, another lesson from Russ Akoff which is the best way to learn something is to present it to others and then began to focus heavily on how do I explain this to others? How do I explain this to others? You know, um, Deming's work or Akoff's work or Taguchi's work. And, and so what I am constantly striving for are everyday examples that I believe would appeal to people to pique their curiosity on what it means to manage white bead variation to look at things in the system or or i may use examples of of the opposite of that focusing on things in isolation and so i i've just been you know i have very heightened sensitivity toward listening and hearing and seeing examples that i can use in seminars and presentations in my writing mm -hmm. that i think are you know, very, very simple. So I don't like to use complicated examples. I like to use very, you know, because you can, if you, the trouble with making it, like, the idea is not to make it complicated. The idea is to make it very, very simple. So the example of you're in a supermarket, you're sorting through fruit, you're sorting through parking spots, you're, um, and so I, I like to, yeah, because my, my theory is that that people have great experience in looking at things the system by looking at the variation and the elements of the system and focusing on how these things come together, whether it's managing a wedding and not just selecting any food, but having food of a specific type that matches the audience, the music matches the audience. So I step back and look at everyday activities that people get engaged in. And as I you know, think through what are the elements of the planning of these events, of these activities, I realize that you know, these are great examples of you know, planning a party, planning a vacation, planning a wedding, planning a trip to the store that, you know, I mean, here's a, here's a simple one for you, that if, um, you know, when I run errands, you know, I don't run to the store, buy milk and then come home and then and then run to the store and buy bread and then come home, unless I forget. <laughs> but I like, you know, before I go to the store, I ask my wife and ask our son, or if they go, they ask me, you know, we're running out to the store, you need anything. But then while I'm running out to the store, I may, while I'm out, you know, go to the bank and deposit a check or go to the drugstore and pick up a prescription. So what I find is, you know, when we're running a bunch of errands, you know, what do we do? We don't look at those errands in isolation. We look at those errands activities as part of a system and we have in our mind, where should we go first? Where should we go second? Where should we go first? But we're not going all over the place with all these extra steps. So, so basically so everyone like, applies system thinking. Yeah, so I like to get, so I, my thing is if I can create a, you know, develop is to develop mental models to look at how we do things and then communicate, share them with people and then listen for their interpretation of them and then use those as, as, 
as triggers to improve the awareness of what they already do. So again, mm-hmm. what's, what's, what's essential is instead of trying to, you know, having somebody say, you know, convince me why I should use the Deming philosophy, my approach is to convey to them that they already do. Because <laughs> their attitude is like, you know, why should I try a new approach to, um, to management? And then my approach is to say, well, let me show you how you already use this approach to management in your personal life and how practical it appears to you. And if it makes sense for you to use it, then it might you might find it makes sense to others you work with to use it. And in fact, um, don't be surprised that they use the same system. So if you're all using this approach in your personal life, there's aspects of it. I'm not saying we got it all right, but I liked it. My strategy is to point out the aspects of the Deming philosophy that people use in their personal lives and get people to then realize that this is not a new approach. It's something they have experience with. Yeah, and the reason I just hesitated is there are um, there are aspects of the Deming philosophy that that I think are readily apparent in our personal lives, and people can begin to see the value of of doing taking what they're doing at home and then bring it to work. And there's some things we do at home, or some things we do at work, I'd say, such as um, performance appraisals or grades in school, where we assign you know a letter grade to a student or assign a performance appraisal to a worker which is again like thinking that the red beads are caused by the worker um those become things that are uh, that are essential to explore why because if we if we use performance appraisals we're more likely than not causing the organization to be divided between those who got good grades and those who got bad grades or those who got more red beads and those who got less red beads without the re- a, a, a appreciation that a lot of that difference is due to luck. And, and, um, and this, this has a lot to do with Dr. Deming's um, system of profound knowledge and the psychology aspect. I think the more we dwell on, on who caused red beads or thinking that you know, that red beats are caused by individuals, then we move them in a mode of, of, of blaming one another or trying to protect one another. And that moves us away from improving how we work together. Because again, the strategy is that the grade focus and the part focus are looking at things in isolation. And what Deming's talking about is, is that those are activities in a mindset which are opposite the value in looking at things in terms of relationships and how they work together. Because again, if, if teamwork, you know, that phrase, mm-hmm. you, know, um, you know, working together for the greater good, well, the idea of together is about relationships, not about parts. The idea of thinking together is about relationships, working together is about relationships, learning together is about relationships. And so my focus is, is trying to, explain to people that the, their natural way of thinking of think, thinking about things in terms of relationships to reinforce that together term and then step back to look at the value of, of how this contributes to an organization where people learn together and work together by improving how they how they think together. That's an interesting concept that blame robs us from working together, thinking together and learning together, ascribing blame in a system. But I want to get down to, you have spoken a lot about the system of profound knowledge in, in pieces at various points in the interview. What is the system of profound knowledge and what makes it so powerful in bringing greater awareness, thinking to the manager, to the leader, to the individual in bringing about transformation? in an organization or space. All right, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a fun question. Um, <laughs> what comes to mind is 
uh, when a, an old friend, um, Claire Crawford Mason, who used to host dinners, her and her husband would host a dinner on Saturday night on a regular basis with Dr. Deming as a guest. And, and she said, Dr. Deming's week would involve um, being at their house on Saturday evening for dinner, and then the next morning getting up, going to church, and then sometime after church, Dr. Deming would if he was teaching at New York University in New York City, he would you know, get on the train or however he got to New York City and teach on Monday morning at, at um, New York University, I think Monday afternoon at Columbia. And then the, it could well be a good portion of the, the rest of the week would involve him delivering a four day seminar somewhere and then flying home on Saturday morning or Friday night and then getting caught up with his laundry and letters and you know, responding to correspondence. And then Saturday evening, going back to, back to Claire, Claire Crawford Mason's house with her husband, Bob. And, and so she explained this routine. And she said, one evening, Deming came over and, and he was complaining. Or, you know, he had, he had, that week, he had visited some organizations. And so instead of a seminar, he had visited some organizations. And he commented on how they... Um, and she said, you know, what was it like? Well, she said, you know, they, they just don't have, you know, basic knowledge. And she said, well, what do you mean basic knowledge? And, and he began to articulate it as um, they lack, they lack knowledge, what kind of knowledge? And she said, he said, they lack um, profound knowledge. So she remembers distinctly him saying they lack knowledge. And then she asked for what kind of knowledge? He said, profound knowledge. She then asked, what do you mean by that? She said, he then started to list things like they don't understand the difference between common causes and special causes. They don't understand the difference between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. She said, he began to list off, she said, as, as many as you know, 18 to 20 things they don't understand. Well, she wrote them on a napkin unbeknownst to him, typed them up. So the following weekend, he came over for dinner and she met him at the door with this typed list of these, you know, these elements of profound knowledge. And she said, he, he looked at the list and he said, what's this? And she said, well, you know, last week you're over and I kept notes and these are the things you told me are the, are as, you know, elements of this new thing you call profound knowledge. And she said, he looked at the list and he said, you know, I can do better than that. And so what's neat is he was compelled to solve this riddle as to what are organizations missing this thing called profound knowledge. And so what we see today in terms of uh, the four elements of profound knowledge, which are looking at things as a system, an understanding of, of variation, uh, psychology, which gets into people and motivation and inspiration, Thinking, fourth, awareness. The fourth, yeah, they're thinking their awareness. And then the fourth element of the system of profound knowledge, he'll refer to as the theory of knowledge or this notion of, you know, um, how people do. Yeah, how we learn and uh, we were guided by theories. So that those four elements, and as, you know, as a system, meaning not just them separately, but the connection between them, as a, which makes it a system is something that evolved over several years. Uh, in fact, one friend, um, Professor Joyce Orsini, her, she was working closely with him. You know, he, she was seeing him on a regular basis. And, and she claimed that the last five years of his life, which would be 1988 to 1993, he was you know, deeply invested in, in getting these ideas out of his head into this book. And so, um, so that's a little history on that length, lengthy list he shared with Claire Crawford Mason and how it came down to these four elements. And, um, and then he went on to say, you, know, you need not be an expert in any or all four in order to apply them. And what I find is, I mean, the characteristic way of managing, explaining things is to explain to people, you know, what did Dr. Deming mean by system? What's included in that? And you'll see in this book a chapter on systems, 
with a decent amount of context coming from Russell Lakoff, you'll see an explanation of the variation in um, control charts, um, control chart for the red beads, and, and discussions of common cause variation and special cause variation, a process being in control. And so that, you know, that discipline, which he learned uh, extensively through his me being mentored by, as well as uh, uh, friendship with Russ, with um, Walter Schuhart, that's the variation piece. The, the psychology piece is not necessarily something Deming had studied firsthand, but he learned a lot about being surrounded by people who were psychologists who nudged him to realizing there's a, there's a people aspect here. You know, now you get into Alfie Cohn's work and Punished by Rewards, which is the book that followed the No Contest. And, and so Dr. Deming was intrigued by this people aspect. It wasn't just variation, it wasn't just systems, but you have to, you have to, you've got to know something about people and their um, innate motivation or demotivation. The theory of knowledge piece, I would and say- And what robs them of their motivation, I guess. What's that? And what robs them of their motivation? Well, what, what, what robs them of that, right. And so, so Deming learned about, learned a lot about systems and, and, and credits lear, learning about systems from, from Russ Akoff. He obviously credits Schuhart learning about variation. Um, psychology, there are a number of people that he worked closely with. Um, again, I'll just say Alfie Cohn is, is one um, that, that got him thinking about the implications of his work relative to people. And then the theory of knowledge piece, the fourth element, he was heavily inspired by um, C.I. Lewis and, and, and encouraged to read C.I. Lewis's work, the, the Harvard philosopher from the early 1900s, and looked at Lewis's work to gain an understanding that um, the impact of our, of our learning associated with everything we do being guided by a theory. And, and so here what's neat is, um, one of the things I learned from Makoff, Russ would say, learning is what happens when things don't go as planned. Now, when things don't go as planned, that could be financially painful. That could be time-wise painful that you got to do something again. Um, it could be physically painful. You know, I was in a bike accident last week and um, that was that right? and, the, and the pain and the accident was painful and as a result of what I learned in that accident I've, I've decided to change how I ride my bike so I can avoid avoid doing that again and and so so Deming talks about a theory as a prediction of the future with a chance of being wrong and and he learned was you know learned that epistemology from C.I. Lewis and then um, you know, I was, my appreciation of that was enhanced by my association and learning from Makeoff. And so you put all those together, Deming saying is, you know, imagine an organization where people, instead of being demotivated or inspired to, you know, let's just, I just quickly go through everything we've been talking about there. They're, instead of being demotivated, they're inspired. They're looking for how do we, you know, is there an opportunity to improve how things integrate? And how do we do that? We, we look at how they currently integrate, you know, instead of banging things together with hammers, you know, imagine somebody says, I wonder if we manage the variation of the elements of the system using control charts. And, and if we can change the common cause variation to perhaps have less of it or more of it, if we can change the average of the distribution. So we take the distributions and make them wider and narrower, but move them left and right, which is managing common cause variation. Imagine if we do that, which is what Dr. Taguchi's work is about, is managing that common cause variation. Imagine we have a theory that if we go about and make these changes, we can, we can change the variation to improve integration. And we're inspired to do that. And if we're wrong, we change our theory. And so all that comes together so, so beautifully um, but if we aren't inspired because we're being blamed for red beads, or we aren't inspired because we're so focused on the red beads, there's no time to work on the white beads, or we're demotivated by performance appraisals, 
or we're demotivated because um, others won an award that we think we contributed to the work of, or our boss tells us to focus on our department and nobody else's department. So it's, it's very easy to see how the prevailing system of management, as Dr. Deming would say, can, can stifle us and, and, and take us from a home mode of looking at how we manage errands as a system, how we build that product in the garage as a system. And then we go to work and get put in this little box and we are, you know, our, our motivation becomes diminished. I want to piggyback from there and lead off into a discussion about the management of people within the Deming lens and the Deming view of management and his philosophy. Deming suggests that rewards and recognitions are generally forces of destruction, squeezing out the individual over time, robbing him of his sense of purpose, his intrinsic motivation, and thereby sub-optimizes the system, fosters competition for the stars and the recognition. Because you talked earlier about uh, performance evaluation and so on. How do we begin to restore in people as we manage through the Deming lens that extrinsic motivation, um, to, that, that not, not extrinsic, the, the intrinsic motivation that lies within them, their joy in learning, their own power, uh, appreciation for the, 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 the we versus the I. How do we unlock that power using these Deming lens? I know Deming goes a lot into it. And like you said, you don't like to preach or philosophize, but how do we bring that out in an organization or unlock that? That, uh, that, that power of we. The one thing I've learned is at least there are, uh, I think trying to tap into what's wrong with performance appraisals, ratings and rankings, rewards and recognition, um, incentives, people talk about incentives. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then in the Deming world, people say, you know, incentives don't work. And I remember spending a lot of time talking about this with, with Gypsy Randy, who's, who was um, mentored for many years by Dr. Deming and, and Gypsy and I agree that incentives do work. <laughs> That's why they're used, but they, they work to continue the way systems operate, which is to cause people to focus on the incentive, which tends to be what's best for me, not what's best for the system. Now, what I would say is if you want to engage management in a conversation as to the dark side of how organizations treat people, and the dark side meaning the use of rewards, the use of incentives, the use of of ratings and rankings, the use of performance appraisals. And I think to, to go into an organization and say, these things are wrong. Stop doing it. <laughs> stop, stop doing it, I think is. Not going is to not get you anyway. It is not an approach I would take. So then you say, well, what approach would I take? Well, the approach I would take is to work with the senior management team, get them exposed to the excitement and possibilities of working in an environment of, of incredible collaboration, um, continual improvement in terms of, you know, achieved through managing white bead variation as a system. And this is what we did at Rocketdyne. We went off and put the ideas into practice in terms of how processes were, were followed, how hardware was built, how hardware was integrated, how hardware was performed. And by demonstrating the, the economic value 
of, of systems which can be assembled without mallets, because that's that's the bottom line. If, if you want to appeal to senior management, then you need to speak their language. And their language is, you know, is about profit. Now, Dr. Deming was not a was not against profit. Russ Akoff was not against profit, but where they're coming from is that profit is the result of how well we work together, as opposed to profit is the reason we come to work. See, if you adopt a non-deming approach to profit, then you go around the organization and try to improve profit in the pieces. And that could make things worse overall because you don't understand things in the system. So the approach we were looking at within Rocketdyne was, if we could put the ideas into practice and show the viability of, of developing, designing hardware, which was, you know, snap fit, you know, assembled with far less effort, performed far better than ever before, then that could open a door to executives asking, how do we do more of this? How do we do more of this? What can we do to spread these ideas across the corporation? But the idea was first we got their attention on what they wanted, which was more profit or higher performing hardware. And then the strategy was now that we have your attention, now there's a framework for understanding that in order for this to be extended, we need to get rid of get rid of the things that cause people to think of themselves, whether that's how do I get the award or how do I get the best performance. And, and so our strategy was to demonstrate to management first the incredible economics of, of the applicability of the Deming philosophy, and then start to look at the impediments and the notion that um, if if we have a procurement system which says buy on price tag alone, how that could undermine the gains that we achieve. So our, our strategy was, let's go off, find some incredible applications, make it impossible to ignore that that these solutions came from the Deming philosophy, unlike we had ever seen before. And then while we had their attention. I remember meeting with with one executive and I said, you know, because um, again, he just loved what we were doing. And I said, I said, one thing I want to bring to your attention is, is how is the impact of what we're doing by having performance appraisals, ratings and rankings and awards and recognition and, and incentive systems. And I said, I said, what we've achieved has been achieved by people who are willing to do amazing things. But then I wanted to point out is, is that these practices would be detrimental to their willingness to collaborate. And so mm -hmm. even though my boss was the VP of operations, he was not an HR and, and we were a, a division of, of a big corporation called Boeing. What I wanted him to know was, you know, because again, he loved the results and he was so, um, it's just in a, one of the best people I've ever worked for because he, he just loved what we were doing and gave us a lot of freedom to go off and do amazing things. And we did. And then, then once we achieved them, I said, you know, essentially what I was saying is you've not seen anything yet. I said, I said, what we've accomplished is amazing. But I was also saying is, is that these practices called rewards and recognition, rating and ranking um, rewards and recognition, the, the example I gave was those are ankle weights. Those are weights around our ankle. And I said, they will slow us down in how fast we could run. Now, I also knew that he was not going to make that change tomorrow. So going back to your point, my strategy is to get executives excited by the possibilities and then have a a frank conversation as to whether or not the obstacles to running faster and faster are within their control or outside of their control. But I want them to know that the things I was you know, in, involved in doing within Rocketdyne could be applied within their organizations with great success. 
but I want them to know that there are everyday obstacles to achieving those results on a sustained basis. And then if we decide to go forward and do training, I want them to be prepared for pushback from people who say, hey, um, you know, we learned from Bill and his colleagues that performance appraisals are bad and they cause us to, to think narrowly. So why do we do those things? And, and so because the, the training will, will definitely bring that up. And so my hope is that the organizations will become, a, they'll be excited by the possibilities. They'll begin to look at the deadly diseases and the Deming's 14 points and look at obstacles to running faster and faster. Well, and that but as to what can be done to minimize those, um, because if if there's one I, one my concern is that if I don't if I'm not upfront with them and, and explain here's the upside, all the things you could achieve, mm -hmm. and here are the here are the barriers. Mm -hmm. If I don't point out the barriers that I'm not being honest with them, even though the barriers may not be within their immediate realm. I want them to at least be in agreement that they don't like them, but maybe they can't do anything immediately about it anyway. But but the idea being that how can we manage white bead variation if if doing so requires people to think beyond their box, to take into account others, other departments, others within the organization, it may it may cause them to you know, it, it may cause their department to go over budget in order to save the corporation a lot of money. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a simple example. This is really funny. And um, I was in an organization with with um, Dr. Taguchi, and in an example, one of the case studies presented to Dr. Taguchi was a situation where the um, their performance of the of the product was was um, very hard. So 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 as when the customer used the product, there was a lot of effort associated with physically using it because the parts didn't quite. I mean, it's it like the 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 everyday use of the product by the consumer was a lot of work um, because. The parts were managed. I mean, I mean, so somehow the company got the parts together. But when the customer went to use it, every time they went to use it, they experienced the struggle of a, a physical struggle in using it. So, in other words, the product in their hands was not snap fit. And so the engineer that presented this case study said that he figured out that if the plant manager hired someone to help them manage variation of the system, for example, through the use of control charts that in managing the variation of the system, the extra effort that the customer was seeing would drop dramatically. So what was so cool was the engineer presented a, a, an account of a product this company designed and built, had, had actual data of how aggravating it was for the consumer to use because physically how, how they used it was a struggle. And he had a proposal for what it would take the plant manager to shift the performance to be something that was easy to use. And Dr. Taguchi said, what did the plant manager say? And he said, the plant manager said, said no. And he said, so what did he want to do? He says, well, he didn't want to hire an extra person. And then Dr. Taguchi said, why didn't he want to hire an extra person? He said, why should I spend my budget to save the corporation? So what was so <laughs> is that without revealing the name of the company is that what the engineer was proposing was on the order of a you know hundred thousand dollar a year investment by the plant manager to to create a position where someone had responsibility for helping to manage the parts as part of a system and 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 what he showed was that that investment would have a return that was about 20 times. He had data to show that the customer warranties, the customer warranty claims on using that product were 
on the order of 20 times more. Yeah, on the order of on, the, on the basis of improper use. Yeah, I mean, improper this handling. $100, this $100,000 investment would have had a 20 time return to the corporation. So hmm. what the guy was saying was, why should the money come out of my budget? If the savings goes to the corporation, why should I use my money? And, and I walked out of there thinking, holy cow, so the good news is this engineer had a phenomenal approach to going forward through his appreciation of where Dr. Taguchi was coming from. And Dr. 